Hello, everybody. My name is Jason DaCosta. Welcome to my show. Thank you for joining me. I feel like those are my four opening little mini lines to every audio that I do. It just kind of flows. It's like Don Preston when he says, good Monday morning to you. Um, it's just something that kind of stuck, and uh, I may never have a name for the show, but I do enjoy saying those four lines. So uh, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Um, today we're going to be talking about the Galatians, and we're going to um, try to define biblically uh, who the Galatians were by uh, scriptural deduction, I guess you would say. Um, the answers are truly there. You just kind of have to search for them, um, but they're all there. And um, there's really a couple arguments that really put the whole case to bed before you even open the book of uh, the letter to the Galatians, to be honest. But um, I've found that there are some very dishonest folk out there. Um, most of the people see that first argument that I'm going to present here shortly, and they basically um, say, you know what, you're right. <laughs> that's, that's undeniable. How can you get around it? Um, we would call those types of people honest. Um, but other people don't like to give in that easily, and they kind of like to cling. So um, there requires a little more effort. And I think that uh, today I will demonstrate from the letter itself um, why this was written to um, uh, Israelites, okay, or elect diaspora, um, whatever you want to call them, all right? Um, but before we do that, uh, we are going to talk very briefly about um, the idea of salvation today. Um, have you ever noticed that uh, salvation today is quite different than salvation that we see in the New Testament? Um, and what I mean by that is, is basically what I'm focused on here is the Holy Spirit aspect of salvation or so-called so salvation today versus what that looked like in the New Testament last days. Um, literally today, nothing happens to people at so-called the moment of salvation or conversion. Um, there's no proof. There's no Holy Spirit baptism. Um, there's no uh, miraculous signs. There's no tongues. Um, and and you, you can argue until you're blue in the face, but the Bible just flat out says that the Holy Spirit um, was only for those last days. Joel 2, this is a prophecy of Joel, uh, Joel 2, speaking of Israel's last days, then when God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh uh, and, and young uh, men would see dreams, daughters would see visions, and blood, fire, vapor of smoke would all occur before the great and coming day of the Lord. That was leading up to the end. That was not a continuous um, deal and that also pertain to the all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved that comes from Joel as well and that's a promise to Israel for their last days so it's universal in the sense of all within the confines of the story who called upon the Lord would be saved but it is not universal in the sense of all humanity um, but uh, you know you see these people say oh I was saved you know I, I was saved and you ask them Oh really? You know, like how do you know, and and how, how are you so sure? And they're like, well, I made a, I made a decision for Christ, and uh, okay, well, was there any viable proof? Did the did, were you baptized with the Holy Spirit? Did you speak in tongues? Did, um, you know, the Holy Spirit come upon you with great power, like the Bible says, uh, like we see at the at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came? Did He fall upon you? Um, and usually, no. I mean, of course, you have the remnant who you know claim all these miraculous gifts. Um, like for instance, one, one kid who's, who's, uh, very much into the miraculous, um, who used to be a friend of mine on Facebook, he, and he has a big following because as you know, that there's a certain type of people who enjoy that sort of, um, sort of fantasy idea. Um, and they, uh, this particular, uh, kid, uh, I won't mention his name, but I remember a post that he put up and it was from like a couple years prior, he claimed, and it was from him being at a church, some kind of like, you know, uh, spiritual, uh, uh, I don't know, even renegade or not renegade, what do they call it? Crusade, a uh, spiritual crusade at some church where there was some amazing spiritual healer and this guy just had so many powers and, um, and he just did so many amazing things. And this kid put up a picture, believe it or not, this is what he did. He put up a picture of, of his leg. Uh, one leg, and, and it was just an angle so you could see the bottom of his leg, like the last maybe, I don't know, 12, 20 inches of his leg. Um, and it showed his jeans were um, 
let me see how to put this. It showed that uh, I guess it sh- somehow it, he he pictured it. He demonstrated it in the picture that his leg was shorter than his other leg. He had one one uh, both legs straight out, and one of his legs was uh, you know ironically and shockingly it was an inch or two shorter. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, wow, that's that's interesting how you don't show uh, any higher than the shin in that picture. Um, you just see basically from the shin down that one foot um, was about an inch or two shy. And then in the next picture, he shows that all of a sudden the uh, the legs are even, the feet are dead even. And then the final picture was a picture of his face in just sheer shock and sheer uh, surprise that this had happened. And I just saw this thing and just... <laughs> I really, really, I, I had to laugh. I mean, what else can you do? Ain't nobody got time for that. It just really, it was was comical to me that, and so many people bought into this, you know, like, oh, praise God, this, that, and the other. Um, but yet, you know, these these guys are all over the place. They're they're frauds, and they um they prey on the uh, the gullible and and um, the people who you know desperately want this so bad, who do not know their Bibles and do not know the story well enough to know that. Uh, the Holy Spirit was a promise for Israel. Uh, it was promised in their last days. Um, it was a uh, transitory vehicle, if you will, to carry them into the kingdom. Um, and as uh, Jesus said that the helper would be with them, it, they were, it was a helper for them to take them to the end. Um, he who endures to the end will be saved. He sent the helper. The helper would give them words to speak when they were dragged before councils and so on. Um, but that end already came. And, and I think Paul in Ephesians 1 makes it really clear. He says uh, in verse 13, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, ready, until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit was only guaranteed uh, until they received their inheritance. Uh, And as we know from the story that uh, happened at the end of the age when the saints um, inherited the kingdom that was prepared for them. So uh, the idea of a continuous Holy Spirit is just silly. Nobody has the Holy Spirit today. That was that was Israel's history. Um, And coming from a guy like me who actually had this amazing experience with God in a hotel room in sheer pain and sheer agony calling out to God for mercy and for relief from that pain and receiving an answer in a split second a a, a tangible uh, uh, feel I could feel I could feel his answer it, it literally um, sort of shot through my body and all my pain was gone in an instant um, but even still, I knew that that was not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It just wasn't. Um, it was uh, a divine being who heard my cry and who eliminated my pain and my sorrow and gave me peace. And the uh, the Holy Spirit um, that we see in the Bible was completely different than that. The Holy Spirit was given as a um, uh, means to carry them to the end, which uh, clearly we know the end is behind us. So that whole application just doesn't work. Um, so whatever that was in that room that day, um, I'm thankful for it, of course. It, it opened my eyes and kind of set me on fire to learn more about um, why we're here and, and who our creator is. Um, but to uh, suggest that that is in line with Israel's history, their last days, their outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which Joel says was in those last days, um, then I would, you know, I would also have to become a futurist again and carry the last days some 2,000 years now. Um, because the the Holy Spirit was linked to those last days, so uh, just a couple of things to consider there, and and maybe one day I'll do a uh, uh, a full teaching on the Holy Spirit and why he's he has uh, he was only for them and um, why the gifts have ceased and all that because the proof is there. It's just you know people want to believe what they want to believe. Um, but today we're going to talk quickly about the Galatians and who they were. Um, we're going to begin in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 because 1 Peter chapter 1 is pretty much a lock and shut case. It's an ironclad proof text. Um, Peter, opening up his letter in 1 Peter chapter 1, says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. 
So Peter opens up his letter, addressing it to the pilgrims of the dispersion, the dispersed Israelites. There is only one dispersion that we uh, that we are aware of in this story. We can't just invent our own uh, dispersion here. The dispersion that is in uh, reference here is the scattering of uh, the Israelites out into the nations. Okay, and um, that happened in their history, and here we are in their last days. And suddenly the shepherd is seeking out his sheep. He, he came for the lost sheep. And so we have this letter going out to the pilgrims of the dispersion in these regions. And one of the regions, if you notice, was Galatia. All right. And they were the elect according to the foreknowledge of God, being sanctified of the spirit for, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. And so what we have to understand here is logically it makes no sense for peter to be addressing his letter only to the elect diaspora and leaving out all those who the people would say were also uh, part of the church meaning those that were not of the dispersion um, it, peter was addressing his complete audience here he was not uh, ignoring some and writing specifically to others um, there uh, the the, the events and the uh, topics of Peter's letters are the same events and the same topics that are in all the other books of the New Testament. And yet here Peter is only addressing this letter to the elect of the dispersion, the pilgrims of the dispersion in these regions, um, therefore showing clearly um, that those in Galatia were also elect uh, diaspora, uh, the elect uh, dispersed of Israel. Now, if that's not enough to convince you, um, we can go to Second Peter, in, in the same uh, to the same written to the same audience. Peter in uh, chapter three, when speaking of Paul's epistles, writes this. He says, "Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, in other words, the coming of the Lord." Uh, he says, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Ready? As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. And then he go, and then he says, as also in all his epistles, speaking of them in these things in which some are hard to understand, etc. So, uh, Peter basically shows Paul's cards there. He says that um, Paul also wrote to you about these same things in all of his epistles. And that just goes to show you that we do not have all the, uh, all the letters. I mean, um, Peter opens up that uh, first letter writing to the, the, the dispersed in Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Um, I mean, granted, we have the book of Ephesians, the book of uh, Colossians, which um, were both in Asia. We have the book of Galatians. But um, as far as I know, the other regions, we really don't have uh, the letters. And Paul, uh, Peter references um, epistles that were written by Paul to those places, to these uh, elect dis diaspora in these regions. But the point here to, to get back on track is that um, Peter shows us clearly um, that there is no uh, differentiating between Paul's audience and Peter's audience. Both of them wrote to the elect diaspora, uh, and that is evident by what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 and forward. And then, of course, we know from other places like James. Uh, James opens up his letter um, to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad. Greetings, my brethren. And um, so... You know, the point is, is that these these uh, apostles uh, by this time, by the time these letters are going out, um, which was, you know, within the last 10, 20 years before the end, um, they were addressing their letters to their audience, to the elect. And they reveal who the elect were very clearly. It makes no sense for them to be writing these letters and excluding um, everyone else beyond the elect diaspora uh, if, in fact, there were others that were included in this promise. Um, what makes more sense is that they were actually writing to those whom it pertained to, just like any normal human being would do, uh, and they addressed their letter to those whom it pertained to. Uh, if I was writing a letter and uh, I wanted to um, write it to my mom and my dad, uh, would it make any sense for me to address the letter, Dear Mom? If all the events and all the writings in that letter pertain to my dad as well. Of course, it doesn't make any sense. If I was writing a letter to my mom and my dad and I wanted them to both 
understand that the events of that letter pertain to them both, I would address it, dear mom and dad, or dear parents. I would not exclude my dad and just focus in on my mom. Um, that, number one, is illogical. It makes no sense. And it's also kind of rude. I mean, why would Peter uh, be excluding these so-called outsiders, these foreigners, um, and only focusing in on the elect diaspora? Same with James and same with Paul, as Peter says in uh, in Second Peter 3. Just It just makes no sense. So, to me, that point right there is ironclad. It's undeniable. You cannot get around it. Um, Peter says that the, the saints in the region of Galatia were the elect diaspora. He then also refers to the epistles that Paul wrote to them also about the same things. Um, so therefore, Paul also wrote to the elect diaspora in the book, uh, in the letter to the Galatians. And um, that's it, folks. That's all I got for you today. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but that is sort of like the, the ironclad argument that cannot uh, be defeated. And if anyone ever tries to uh, argue that, um, I would suggest just walking away because they're dishonest. Um, but we're going to look quickly through the book of Galatians and just mention a few notes. Um, if you have not listened to my previous four videos now on my channel, they are titled, Who Were the Colossians? Who Were the Ephesians? Who Were the Romans? And um, yesterday I posted, Who Were the Corinthians? Uh, in all four of those audios, I believe I demonstrate handily why each of those letters are written to the elect diaspora and those um, those of the covenant, uh, and they did not pertain to outsiders. Um, I, I've gotten some incredibly, incredibly positive feedback on those, both publicly and privately, so um, I know that people can see it, and I'm not the only one here, which is nice. Um, so if you haven't listened to those four, do yourself a favor, check those out. And then when you have listened to them, or if you have already... Ask yourself why any of these letters would be different. If those four main letters, Colossians, Ephesians, Romans, and Corinthians, are all written to the elect diaspora and to the Israelites that were out in the nations, the Gentiles, which simply means those in the nations outside of Israel, okay? Um, if that's the case and that is true, then why would any of these other letters be uh, written to anybody different? It just doesn't make sense. As you can see, we're building a case here, and the foundation seems to be getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And then sooner or later, there's really not going to be a lot of proof for uh, the other position, which is that um, God was saving just anybody who would respond to this gospel, which really makes no sense. Because if you know what Paul said in Romans 11, uh, he said specifically that the fullness of the Gentiles, meaning the fullness of those in the nations, um, had to be uh, brought back in before the end. And so all Israel would be saved. So um, makes no sense to have a full number of saved Gentiles, meaning saved people out in the nations, uh, if in fact this gospel was for everybody and it was just going to continue on for all time. Why, why would there be a complete number? Um, but that's another story for another day. In Galatians chapter 1, in verse 1 through 4, we, we read this, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God our Father. So, a couple things to note, of course, he addresses it to the brethren, okay, and I keep coming back to that word brethren because I think we don't understand it properly. Brethren was actually a term used for uh, their true brethren, their kinsmen, all right, but um, the part that's noted that I want to notice here in verse 3 is that he, uh, I'm sorry, verse 4, he says that Christ gave himself for our sins, all right, and, and if we know where that comes from in the Old Testament, it's basically, uh, well, it comes from many places, but Isaiah 53. Uh, Isaiah 53 is all about Israel. Uh, I'll just read it so that you can uh, kind of get the gist. It says, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. And, as a, uh, and he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sor sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He who was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and, he, and who will declare his generation? So, and then he says, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. So we'll stop there, but that's basically, um, there's more there. But again, we see in there that this is all about Israel. This was the, uh, he was bruised, he was stricken, he was, uh, he borne their griefs. Um, by his stripes, they were healed. He, Isaiah says, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. Uh, I'm sorry, but since when uh, is uh, our outer, uh, since when are outsiders referred to as sheep in the Old Testament? Uh, never. Uh, so all we, like sheep, have gone astray, um, sort of foreshadowing the lost sheep in the nations. Um, those who were being sought back by their uh, uh, shepherd, that, that they would hear his voice and come. Um, and so anyways, it says that uh, he was afflicted. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Uh, he was taken from prison and from judgment for the transgressions of my people, says Isaiah. He was stricken. Well, who is Isaiah's people? Who was he a prophet to? So I think you can see that um, Galatians chapter 1 there in uh, verses 1 through 4 when it talks about he gave himself for our sins. All right, why would Paul be writing to so-called foreigners in the region of Galatia uh, that had no relation to this story and no relation to the Old Testament text uh, and speaking of uh, Jesus who, who gave himself for their sins when Isaiah uh, was speaking all about the people of Israel uh, whom their Redeemer would come and would die for their sins and their transgressions. Um, doesn't make any sense. And of course, we know from Hebrews 9, 15, that Christ's death was for transgressions committed under that first covenant of which uh, no other nation was a part of, unless, of course, they joined themselves uh, individually to Israel's uh, covenant body. But um, the point is, is that of all the, of all the nation, families of the earth, God alone knew Israel. So um, this, was, this was the entire story. And so it, Paul just kind of shows his cards right away. Uh, by sort of quoting uh, Old Testament texts about Christ giving himself for our sins um, while writing to these Galatians, again, showing that they were indeed part of that covenant story. Um, and then we uh, jump forward to the next chapter, Galatians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 4. Read this. Um, Paul says, Then after 14 years I went up, uh, again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me and I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles meaning among the nations but privately to those who were of reputation lest by any means I might run or had run in vain yet not even Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised and this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. All right, so what is he saying there? Well, if you listen to my Colossians teaching in Colossians chapter 2, uh, Paul tells them, these so-called foreigners, as people believe, uh, that they were, quote, dead in trespasses and sins and in the, in the uncircumcision of their flesh. In other words, the uncircum because they were uncircumcised in the flesh of their foreskin, they were dead in trespasses and sins. Go check it out, Colossians chapter 2. It makes no sense for these so-called foreigners in Colossae to be dead because of the uncircumcision of their flesh, which was only a covenant commandment, uh, if these were in fact outsiders, pagans, foreigners. Uh, it makes perfect sense if these were actually the dispersed of Israel um, who were out in the nations, who were still guilty under the covenant commandment of circumcision of the flesh uh, and who had walked away from Yahweh and his law um, and were guilty because of that. They were dead in those trespasses, but they had been brought near by the blood of Christ. So um, what Paul says here about Titus, he says, yet not even Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. Again, there's that whole play back to Colossians. Titus was, was uncircumcised in the flesh. And these uh, false brethren, these, these um, Pharisees, these Jews, were actually trying to get him to be circumcised. Um, but he, he wouldn't do it. But the point is, is that um, Titus was redeemed and the blood of Christ washed over Titus uh, because he was not circumcised. He was dead in, in, the, in the uncircumcision of his flesh. And that's apparent by what Paul says right there. Um, in the same chapter, Galatians 2, verses 6 and forward say this. 
But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man, for those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was committed to Peter, excuse me, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So what's he saying here? Well, it's very clear. Peter was going to be the apostle, the main apostle that would go to the Jews. Paul was going to be the main apostle that would go to the nations, okay? Not not Gentiles. Stop thinking Gentile and think nations, okay? When you think nations, when you think foreign nations, it sort of calms that whole idea down a bit and it brings everything back into focus. If this is really just meaning God, that, that Paul was going out into the nations, then the mission stays centralized and focused on bringing back the children of Israel. All right. If when you read the word Gentile, you automatically think someone who is not related to Israel in any sense of the word, um, then of course you're going to interpret this completely different. But what all that's being said here is that um, uh, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to him, Paul, meaning when they saw that the gospel for those out in the nations who were dead in the uncircumc uncircumcision of their flesh had been committed to Paul, just like the gospel for the circumcised was committed to Peter, meaning just like the gospel for the Jew who was circumcised was committed to Peter, um, he said that uh, for he worked, he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, aka the Jew, also worked effectively in me towards the nations, those out in the nations who were uncircumcised. They were dead in the uncircumcision of their flesh. So that's all it's really saying. Let's not get hung up on the word Gentiles so much. Um, we know that the fullness of the Gentiles, a.k.a. the fullness of the nations, the fullness of those in the nations, came in by the end, according to Paul in Romans 11. If they didn't, then there's no new covenant and Jacob's sins haven't been taken away because that hinged upon the full number of Gentiles coming in, contributing to and finishing and concluding all Israel being saved. Now, if we skip forward to uh, Galatians chapter 3, <clears throat> and verse 1 through 9, we read this. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scriptures say, uh, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So then those who are of the faith of those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So what is that saying there? Um, it's saying, it says this, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Nations are those Gentiles. Okay, so what is he saying? The, the, the scriptures foresaw the fact that Israel would be scattered out into the nations, that, that being Abraham's descendants. They would be pushed out into the nations. This comes from Genesis 48, where Ephraim's uh, descendants are promised to become a, quote, multitude of nations. All right, and that, that is indeed what happened. Um, the northern kingdom was pushed out into the nations in the Assyrian invasion, and they became a multitude of nations. That is exactly what took place. So the scripture foresaw that and promised Abraham that his descendants would become a multitude of nations. And, and that in all the uh, in him all these nations would be blessed, um, and that was because of the the the, the result of uh, his descendants being pushed out. So that's all it's really saying. Uh, in uh, same chapter verses ten to fourteen, we read about the law bringing a curse. It says this: For as many as are of the works of the law law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. 
Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So again, very powerful there. Paul says, as many as are of the works of the law, those are the ones that are under the curse. So you can see the limited scope, the exclusivity of the curse, because we know that the law, and this is not some moral law written on the heart, because he says right there, uh, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of law. This is not a law written on the heart. This is actually a codified set of laws given to the people. And he says that as many as are of the works of that law and under that law are under the curse. And then he says, uh, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, why is he writing to Galatians, supposedly in a foreign land, in a foreign nation, supposedly true outsiders, true foreigners, um, and yet saying that Christ redeemed them from the curse of the law? These ones in these foreign nations were not under the curse of the law because, as Paul says, uh, only those who are of the works of the law were under the curse. And as we know from numerous portions, if you followed me along, that, that no other nation had God's law. None did. Moses said, what other great nation has this law? I think if you read in the book of, uh, I believe it's Ezra, maybe Ezra 3, I'm not sure I'd have to find it, but uh, there's, a, there's an amazing portion there um, when uh, one character comes up to the king and says, you know, there's people in your land, and they, he's speaking of the Jews, he says, there's people in your land, and, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but, um, then these people, they have their own law, and they do not abide by our law, you know, and so, again, it just goes to show the exclusivity of who had the law, and it was only Israel, so they were only under the, they were the only ones under the curse, and it says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the nations, okay, that word is Gentiles, but again, upon the nations in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. All right, so he's speaking to the nations, okay? He's saying that the blessing of Abraham might come upon you, you nations, you, you Gentiles out in these nations, in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. All right, and then... Um, I hope that's clear. Uh, verse 21 to 24 says about the purpose of the law. Same chapter, he says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scriptures have confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So people get caught up there in verse 22. They say, but the scripture has confined all under sin. Well, yes, it has, but all is limited in its context. All is all those in the covenant, all those who needed the redemption, all those who needed reconciliation. What is reconciliation? If I told you that my girlfriend and I have been reconciled, you would therefore automatically know and assume that prior to that reconciliation, we had a relationship. And somehow, along the way, some way, some shape, some form, that relationship was tainted, was tarnished, and fell apart. But then, through the reconciliation, we were brought back together. This is Israel. No other nation had God. Therefore, no other nation needed reconciliation. And the ministry that was given to these saints was the ministry, as Paul says, the ministry of reconciliation. So why would they be reconciling people who never had God to begin with? It does not work. Okay, and, and he says this, he says that the promise might be given to those who believe, but before faith came, we, we, he says, were kept under guard by the law. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Again, why are these foreigners in this so-called region of Galatia, um, why were they under the law? Why were they kept under guard, guard by that law that Paul says just a few passages prior was the book of law? Now, why, were they, uh, why was the law their tutor to bring them to Christ? Um, because again, these were uh, truly the elect diaspora. They were under that curse. Um, and then later on at the end, we read this uh, very powerful in verse 26. He says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Christ. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. So speaking to, he, he's writing to uh, a mixture here, obviously, in, in Galatians, because in, part, in parts of this, he's telling them not to return back to the law. In other parts, he's talking about um, do not be circumcised to, to certain individuals. So, um, you know, clearly he's speaking to a multitude of different individuals here. He could be speaking to Jews, proselytes. He's also speaking to, obviously, scattered Israelites who were brought back in, and they collectively uh, made up the Church of Christ that was in Galatia. All right, they were the called out ones. All right, so so, and that's why we see Paul preaching in synagogues, preaching outside. He's preaching everywhere. He's fishing for the sheep. He's fishing for the elect. Um, and as many as were appointed to eternal life would believe, like Acts thirteen says. Um, and we know that's the case because like places in Romans 7 where Paul says, um, you know, he says something about the law. And then in parentheses, it says, and I, I speak to those of you who know the law. In other words, he, there's some in, the, in his audience in these churches that knew the law and that were called out from uh, practicing the law. And then there were others of, in, that, in those churches who were not practicing Yahweh's law. Um, and they were uncircumcised in the flesh of their foreskin and so on. So you have a mixture of people here. Um, but uh, all in all, these are truly uh, Israelites who were part of the covenant, all right? Um, and so we see that, and, and we see that he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, free male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And of course, he's writing to, uh, he's writing to people out in the nations who uh, would not have considered themselves part of Israel, all right? These scattered Israelites, like I've said before, they're Gentile in every sense of the word, all right? They were uncircumcised in the flesh. They were mixed in with paganism. Uh, they were uh, observing probably pagan practices. They were not following Yahweh's commandments. So in every sense of the word, they were truly Gentile, all right? Um, and, and that's why we see uh, Paul refer to Titus as a Greek, all right? So, so when he says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, uh, all he's really doing there is saying that all of you, all of you elect uh, diaspora, all of you elect uh, members of the Church of Christ, um, there is no distinction between any of you. Whether you're a Jew who practiced the law, who has repented and came back, whether you're uh, a scattered Israelite who walked away from Yahweh's law and, and mixed with the nations and now you're back, it doesn't matter. Um, there, there is neither male nor, nor female, there's neither slave nor free, you're all one in Christ. And then look what he says in verse 29, he says, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. So you can see that they could not be Christ unless they were Abraham's seed. And they could not be Abraham's seed unless they were Christ. It worked both ways. But the key there is noticing that, again, this is Abraham's seed. Um, and it was not some uh, spiritual idea like, like everybody says today. Uh, and then we go over next chapter to Galatians 4. We're getting to the end here. Verse 1 says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from the slave, though he is master of all. But he is under the guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. So why is Paul writing to the Galatians again, talking about redemption that was only for those who were under the law, not some moral law again, right? It's going back the ne the previous chapter where he talks about the book of law, that those who didn't do everything in that book of law were guilty. So he's speaking of that book of law and he's telling these Galatians that Christ was born of a woman, born under the law to redeem us who were born, who were under that law. That we, he says, might receive the adoption as sons, and we know from Romans nine that uh, in chapters uh, Romans nine in the first few chapters that the adoption belonged to Israel in the flesh. So um, we can see this kind of coming together here that Paul is clearly speaking to these Galatians as though they were under the law, the book of law, the curse of law, not some moral law on on the heart. Um, Galatians chapter five verses one to four say this. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. He's speaking of the law. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. <clears throat> you have fallen from grace. 
So again, that goes back to the whole Colossians 2 thing I said earlier. Um, Paul says that these Colossians were dead in, the, in trespasses and sins and in the uncircumcision of the flesh. In other words, they were dead in the trespasses of the uncircumcision of the flesh of their foreskin as a covenant commandment. Um, and he says here that uh, I testify to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Uh, every man who becomes circumcised, he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So in other words... Um, these the, he's, these Galatians had already known uh, that they were descendants of Abraham. Clearly, this is you know twenty twenty five years after the gospel began going out. Um, so they they had already known, and that's what I mean by we don't get the full story. We just get bits and pieces from the few letters that we do have. So we don't see everything, but clearly they knew exactly who they were. And Paul is just checking in with them and writing them a letter. Um, but the point here is that the. Uh, he basically is telling them, you know, you don't need to become circumcised. Um, Galatians 6, 11, uh, next, pa next chapter, Galatians 6, verses 11 through 15, basically say a lot of the same. Um, I don't think I even need to, to tell you that. Uh, yeah, I guess I could. He says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh. These would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer perse persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So what world was crucified to Paul? It wasn't the world of rock and roll. It wasn't the world of hip hop music. It wasn't the world of sex, drugs, and alcohol. Uh, the world that Paul was crucified to and, and had been crucified to him was the world of law, the covenant world. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And, he, and that whole portion there, he's talking about those who would have them get circumcised so they could boast in that circumcision. Um, but he says, God forbid that I boast in anything but the cross uh, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Uh, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Again, no distinction between the Jew and no distinction between those out in the nations, a.k.a. the Gentiles who were dead in the uncircumcision of their flesh. And then lastly, at the very end of the book, uh, Paul says in verse 16, uh, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. In other words, uh, peace and mercy upon you and upon all those of the Israel of God. In other words, there was an Israel within Israel. There was a remnant according to election. Uh, there was a Israel as a whole, and then there was a elect amount of Israel within Israel. They were the true Israel of God. All right, there was, This is not some concept where uh, we today are considered Israel. That is false. The fullness of the Gentiles came in by the end of the age, resulting in all Israel being saved. You cannot include yourself in that category today. Uh, we are not Israel. We are not being saved as Israel was in those last days. And that salvation was going to uh, be preached in all the land. And then the end would come, said Christ. So there's just a lot of confusion there. But I'm hoping that today's uh, teaching on uh, the Galatians sort of cleared that up. Uh, and lest we forget the initial uh, point that I made that uh, how Peter um, locks it down for us in 1 Peter 1 and 2 Peter 3, um, that uh, he was writing to the elect diaspora in Galatia and that Paul's epistle also went to the same audience in Galatia as well. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed that one today, and um, this will probably be my last uh, teaching for the week. I am uh, currently in Chicago um, for a meeting, and I will be here until uh, the weekend, uh, and then I hope to commence uh, sharing audios next week um, if all goes as planned. But I uh, hope you all have a great week, and I thank you for uh, tuning in as always. Take care, guys. Thank you.